Because these people really don't know me anymore. And, and they know a version of me that I'm literally trying to heal. I'm trying to heal that sixth grade version of myself. I'm trying to heal that 17 year old version of myself. And yes, those people bring you right back to that time. And they, they might start talking to you about things that they didn't even know traumatized you. It's my and Bialik's breakdown. She's gonna break it down for you. Because you know she knows a thing or two. And now she's gonna break down. It's a break Hi, I'm Ayan Bialik, and welcome to my breakdown. This is the place where we break down the things that make us break down. That is not your normal opening. I have two. I know, but... It's not the more common one. I do not. have two, though. You change it up on us. All right. The person who corrects me best, Jonathan Cohen. <laughs> Let's just say hi to him. It's fine. We're going to use that. I'm jumping in. It's Hi, Jonathan. You caught me off guard. Always do. But you know what? What? I'm finding my way, just like we're going to find our way in this episode, and everyone else is going to learn how to find their way, too. <laughs> Well, gosh, we must be speaking to someone pretty spectacular. Very spectacular. Who is it? Charlemagne the, the God, God. <laughs> which is very exciting. It's very exciting. If people don't know who that is. He was uh, Wendy Williams' second Mike for a handful of years is one of the ways that people may know him. Um, he is the host, one of the hosts of The Breakfast Club, which is Power 105.1 in New York. Uh, it's a very, very big deal. He's a very, very big deal um, in the hip hop kind of music world, but his career has evolved into so much more. And he's he's written two books that Jonathan and I both have had the pleasure of reading. The first is called Black Privilege. Is there a subtitle to it? Yes, what is it, Jonathan? Opportunity comes to those who create it. But it's not like a business, how to succeed in business kind of book. It's his journey and story. And his second book is... Shook One, Anxiety Playing Tricks on Me. And Shook One is an entire exploration of different aspects of mental health challenges that, in many cases, he didn't even know he was dealing with his whole life. And he talks about his journey in therapy. He has a psychiatrist who chimes in every chapter and explains anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. And um, it's really terrific. We're so, so thrilled to um, to speak to Charlemagne the God. Um, just a little bit about him, again, in case you don't know. Um, he was raised as Larry, they called him Larry, McKelvey, in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. And he grew up in a, a, a trailer home and talks a lot about it in the book. His mom was an English teacher and he was raised Jehovah's Witness. Like, there's so many interesting things we get to talk about with him. Um, he worked as a radio intern while he was going to night school and he had various stints on air in South Carolina, but he then became second Mike to Wendy Williams. He established in 2010 The Breakfast Club. It is the most successful hip hop show in radio history, uh, but it's about so much more than hip hop. Um, he's also um, a, a philanthropist, obviously a best selling author. In addition to the incredible presence that he has as an author and also on 105.1, he has hell of a week with Charlemagne the God, Thursdays at 11.30 p.m. Eastern on Comedy Central, executive produced by Stephen Colbert. And what it is, is it's his take on the week's events. I mean, so, so needed. So glad Comedy Central is doing this. So make sure to check that out. His bio refers to him as a cultural architect. And I think that sounds exactly right. He is committed to building an inclusive empire designed to inspire, empower, and elevate the next generation of culture-shifting black creatives. He has a deeply personal vision to help address the unmet and undeserved emotional needs of black people worldwide, and he founded the Mental Wealth Alliance. It supports state-of-the-art mental health services to black people in need while building a long-term system of generational support for black communities. I'm actually going to be donating any winnings that I make when I play Celebrity Wheel of Fortune this fall um, to the Mental Wealth Alliance. Really, really glad um, to, to hear about it, to learn about it, and also just to get to see Charlemagne in action here. We are very, very excited to welcome Charlemagne the God. Break it down. It's really incredible to get to talk to you. I'm gonna ask you a funny question. Do you know who I am? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I used to I used to watch Blossom. Are back you in the serious? Day. Are you younger than me? I'm 46. Oh, yep, I'm two years younger than you. I'm 44. Okay, got it. Jonathan, don't even ask. I have no idea who you are. <laughs> 
<laughs> that, that's expected. But Neither does he. He no, does I'm... not know who he is either. <laughs> For a little context, she starts most interviews being like, why is this person here and why do they want to talk to me? I don't know you, what's you, brought them I'm going to go us. ahead and say this. With all due respect to all of our other guests, including Matthew McConaughey, you are the person that we are most astounded and impressed and honored to have talked to us. Oh, man. So that's really funny that our universes have combined in some way. Abs absolutely. I don't even know where to start because, well, we read, we read both of your books, first of all. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Your second book, you actually write with the loving support of a really knowledgeable, incredible, awesome psychiatrist. And basically every chapter you sort of tackle a topic that is part of our mental wellness, part of mental health. And then he kind of breaks it down in terms of like, this is why he's actually talking about things that scientifically have a basis and here's how we kind of deal with them. It's a really lovely book. Can you talk a bit about why? Why did you choose to do this second book the way you did? Honestly, I didn't want to do a second book, but you know, when you have a super successful first book, you know, your book agent and your publishers and everybody are pushing you to do a second one. And for me, I was like, man, you know, I don't really have anything I want to give to the world right now. Cause honestly, you know, I've been going to therapy for the past, you know, couple of years and any of us who've been to therapy, we all know, Man, once you start peeling back those layers of, 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 you know, just who you are as a person and why you do the things that you do, it causes nothing but utter confusion. Like I was just <laughs> confused. I had no idea who I was because, you know, I had created this identity, so I thought, and this persona, so I thought, and this character, right? And this character had been protecting me all these years and it was the Charlemagne the God person. And now I'm like, yo, I really don't know who, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm unlearning. I, that's, what, that's what it did for me the first couple of years of therapy, just unlearning all these things I thought I knew. And at 40, at the time, I think, what, 40, 41, 42 years old? Like, that's, no, it's longer than that. I might have been 38, 39. I don't remember. It's like 2017. But I was just more confused than ever. Mm -hmm. And so I was telling, I told my book agent that. And she was like, well, would you want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. And I go, I I guess I don't have a problem, you know, discussing some of these things that I'm learning in therapy. And my, my, my first, uh, my, my mentality when I first started writing the book was, okay, I'm going to talk about all of the things my therapist, you know, has told me in regards to my anxiety and depression. And I realized that when your therapist talks to you, it's not for you to explain to other people to make them understand, it's for you to understand. Correct. And so that's why, you know, my, my book agent was like, well, you should you should get a therapist to give these clinical correlations in the book. And, you know, Dr. Ish Major, you know, he went to the University of South Carolina, like like my wife did. With, I'm from South Carolina. So I just felt like he would be a good match, you know, a, a black man hearing this black man from South Carolina talk about these things. And I just thought he would be a good person to help, you know, explain deeper to the reader the things that. I was expressing. So that's how the book came about. Well, and and also I, I think, you know, one of the things that's um, so impressive about the way that you write and the voice that you have is you are, you are completely authentic and unapologetic about needing to speak about things that most people don't want to talk about. And a lot of that does center around the black community and especially the mental health gaps, you know, that exist. And I think, you know, those are the, a lot of what I felt when I really was reading both of your books was why has no one ever said this before the way he just said it? Because that makes sense. And that's what people need to hear. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's painful. But, you know, obviously your mouth has gotten you a lot of places because you say things that other people don't want to. But I just want to say how incredible that is to do surrounding mental health. And in particular to say there is this is what institutionalized racism looks like in a system. This is what intergenerational trauma looks like in a system when you have people who do not trust a system because of legitimate concerns about what the white patriarchal government did to black people. And I think that's so, it's so important that you don't push all that aside and say like, but here's why you should have therapy. You say, this is real. And it is now in your power to try and 
sees your life, and in many cases, that means confronting your darkest stuff. Can you speak a little bit about that? Am I close? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not an expert at anything. Like, I didn't go to college, you know, and I think sometimes, I was just telling my wife this last night, I think sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with people from the academic world, the academic circle, they always have those things they learned in books to fall back on. And they can recite a lot of different things from these things that they've read and they've researched. But for me, I'm like, well, how do you feel? Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any you know, barrier up to fall back on. It's just me, you know? And I don't, I, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I have a lot of experiences in a lot of different things. And so the only way I know how to get help for those things or to find solutions for those things is just to be, you know, very straightforward. My dad used to always tell me the fastest way between two points is a, a straight line. And so that's why therapy was also very good for me. Cause I mean, I have no problem. I've never had a problem being um, transparent. I think what therapy helped me to do is to be, be more vulnerable. And I think also, you know, when, when I start having these conversations, they relate to everybody because everybody is dealing with you know their own different mental health issues and, and that's what that's that's the thing i've been really focusing on lately you know helping all of us to understand that we got more in common than we do differences and it's it's wild the type of uh, conversations that anxiety <laughs> are dealing with depression you know uh, the, the type of conversations that you can have with a whole lot of different people just by being open about you know those things that you're dealing with and one of the things actually that I really, um, really loved how you spoke about it when you talked about anxiety, you also talk about paranoia and you talked about your time when you were dealing as it were. And, you know, you, you described a very, a very normal for the situation, a very normal amount of vigilance you had to have, right? Like you said, like, these are the skills you have to have when you don't know if you're going to be beat up, hustled, like, those are things that served you well. I mean, I'm saying it like in quotes, right? Like it serves you well for the for the situation and environment that you were in, right? And in many ways, probably made you, you know, you were alert, aware of your surroundings. So what you're describing is like, there's a certain amount of behavior that's appropriate for a situation and can be helpful. But what I've learned about anxiety is that if I'm not in a war, if I'm not a gazelle on the plains, I cannot, I can't constantly have my radar up like everything's going to attack me. And I mean, that's, you can personally. I personally you, have you, achieved you can. it. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what that adjustment was to say like, oh, this was anxiety that was normal for this situation, but in the rest of my life, I don't live like that. Well, yeah, first of all, I want to say I used the gazelle reference earlier today because me and my wife and two of my daughters, my 14-year-old and 7-year-old, we were walking and my 7-year-old was lagging behind. And um, I said, I said to her, I said, you cannot lag behind. You have to walk with your family. That's how gazelles That's what get Jonathan caught. always says. They get picked off. That and guess what she said to me? What's a gazelle? Oh, no. <laughs> She's seven. And I had no explanation. So I was trying to think. I was like, damn, what would she know? It's like so an, I started referencing. Yeah, it's I started like an referencing analog? hyenas. Yeah, I started referencing <laughs> hyenas from The Lion King. And it's just like, it did. Long story short, I think she got it, but it didn't work. That's funny saying. though. But jo Jonathan says <laughs> that you'll get picked off if you don't hang with the pack. Yeah, because you know what's so interesting when I think, and, I, and I, I learned this in therapy, I had been dealing with panic attacks way prior to that. I think the first panic attack I remember having was um, being dropped off uh, at Memminger Elementary School in first grade. And I got, I, got, I got dropped off and, you know, I just was in tears. Like when I thought I, I can still feel that trauma from that day. I was just like, oh my God, like my mom just gonna leave me here. Like, you know, I don't, I don't know any of these kids. And it was, it was weird because I don't remember feeling like that in kindergarten. But that first day of first grade, I absolutely positively remember, you know, having a panic attack. And yes, you know, when I was, you know, hustling, selling crack, like it's a certain paranoia that just naturally comes with that. And that's what happens when you really don't know what it is that you're dealing with. Cause I was already dealing with uh, really bad anxiety and didn't know it. And when you're selling drugs, you're adding to that. When you're smoking weed, you know, I didn't know that weed would have that effect on me. I just thought that whenever I smoked weed, I just, in my mind, for lack of a better word, I just was going crazy. Like, 
you know, the world was like chicken little, the sky was falling, like the walls were always closing in. And I could never understand why. I'm like, why does everybody else seem like they're having such a good time? <laughs> oh, but I'm having these, you know, panic attacks. And it honestly wasn't until, man, I was 35, 36 years old. And it was like four, we started the Breakfast Club in 2010. So it was like 2014, 2015. And in my mind, I'm thinking success, money, makes all of these things go away. So when my life was like really relatively normal, like I know I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing, but yet I'm still having these panic attacks and I'm still having this anxiety and I'm still feeling like chicken little, the sky is falling. That's when I knew like, okay, something's not right. And it was other people around me, you know, who I would just be having conversations with and they would just talk to me about therapy. And when I would, ask them why do you go to therapy you know what's 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 the problem like that's that's what we think when we hear somebody say therapy we think there's a problem we think there's something wrong and it is like well you know i i suffer from you know high levels of high levels of anxiety or you know i suffer from depression or you know uh ptsd it's a lot of different things and i was like when i started hearing them i'm like man i think i might i might deal with those same things and so when i started going to therapy and you know talking to my therapist and telling her my story she absolutely positively Agree. Mind Be Alex Breakdown is supported by Helix Sleep. I've had my Helix Sleep for a couple years now, and I sleep well. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes how many, Jonathan? 14. 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. All you have to do is take the Helix Sleep Quiz and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. I like midnight because I sleep all the ways you're not supposed to. Sometimes on my tummy, a lot on my side, rarely on my back, and I like a firm mattress. It comes in a box straight to your door, again, for free. And Helix mattresses are American made. They come with a 10 or 15 year warranty, depending on the model. They've been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors. Helix is offering $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com breakdown. With Helix, better sleep starts now. My MB Alex Breakdown is supported by BetterHelp. So many of us have found ourselves stuck focusing on problems instead of solutions at some point or another. A therapist can help you become a better problem solver, which makes it easier to accomplish your goals no matter how big or small. In addition, a lot of us are used to ruminating, sitting on the problem, turning it over, telling everybody about it. A therapist is the person who lets you move past that, find the main things that are actually bothering you, and be able to find solutions. That's been my experience in therapy and it's very helpful and it's an ongoing process if you're thinking of giving therapy a try better helps a great option it's convenient it's accessible it's affordable and it's entirely online you can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and you can switch therapists at any time when you want to be a better problem solver therapy can get you there visit betterhelp.com break today to get 10 percent off your first month that's better help.com slash break my MB Alex Breakdown is supported by Caraway. Jonathan, what time is it? Is it dinner? It's time to ditch the chemicals. Oh, Caraway right. Home has non toxic cookware and bakeware collections. You can make healthier cooking a piece of cake with no toxins. Caraway Home's non toxic kitchenwares are all designed for the modern home and feature a chemical free ceramic coating. It's high design, upgraded, featuring two unmistakable classic shades, both dressed up in glossy gold hardware, which looks so nice in your kitchen, Jonathan. Super nice. Caraway's Bakeware Set has an assortment of non-toxic baking essentials every modern kitchen needs, so you can get to baking goods without any of the bads. If you cook an egg on one of these pans, <laughs> it's amazing. It just... It slides right off. You could fall on the floor. You got to be careful. <laughs> Visit carawayhome.com backslash Mayam to take advantage of this limited time offer for 10% off your next purchase. This deal is exclusive for our listeners, so where do they go? Visit carawayhome.com slash mime or use code mime at checkout. Caraway. Non-toxic cookware made modern. You do cognitive behavioral therapy, right? CBT, they call it. Was that always the kind of therapy you started doing or did you start with like more classical talk therapy? Yeah, it was just it was just classical, uh, classical talk therapy. OK. And then what is the because for CBT, I've done CBT for some things. Sometimes there's homework or like exercises. What does like if someone doesn't know what CBT is, 
uh, like describe a little bit what like the kind of stuff you do. That's that's exactly what it is. You know, it's it's it's, it's practices, it's exercises, it's actual, you know, tools, you know, breathing exercises, you know, journaling. Like it's a lot of it's actual homework that you take home, you know, and you have to be very aware of, you know, okay, if I'm feeling this, write down what's making me feel like this in in, in this moment. Like so that's literally what it is. It's just, you know, more homework around uh classical talk therapy. Mm-hmm. And, what, and what made me start even gravitating towards that more is because, you know, I got a really good friend, you know, her name is Debbie Brown. And, you know, Debbie told me a long time ago, she was like, you know, therapy is great. You know, therapy is great because it's helping you to understand what it is that you're dealing with. It's giving you the language, you know, to talk about what you're dealing with, but you really have to start healing. And I was confused because you think, you know, therapy is what it's part of the healing process, mm-hmm. but it's, it's really just a gateway drug. It's just a gateway drug to that never ending, you know, journey, you know, called healing. And, you know, healing is not a destination. Like he- we all know healing is not linear and everybody says that all the time, but it's like, what does that mean? Healing is not linear. It means that it's not a destination. It's a constant process. You know, I, I sometimes I, I could be really good and be like, everything's clicking, every, everything's working, the energy cleansing and therapy, everything's working. And it can be one thing that makes me feel like I never did any of that stuff. Breaks me, brings me right back to what, you know, that, that trauma felt like when I was first experiencing it. Mm. So, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process. And so that's why I started going to CBT, just because I wanted to f- do more than just talk. Yeah, well, and CBT is, it's very, um you know, it's it's very destination oriented, meaning what are the thoughts? How do we not make you go there? The idea that therapy as a gateway to, to healing is nonlinear and people don't recognize that it's about starting to understand the trigger, understand what's coming up in the moment. And so to hear you say, you know, things are going great and then all of a sudden, can you give an example? I don't mean to pry, but I think there is de- power in the specificity. Like what's something that, you know, set you off, you know, because it is about understanding when those emotions come up. How do you deal with it? How do you how do you start to reset? Um, For me, it's just like a lot of times it's, it's old relationships, you know, old, old, old people that I'm that I used to call friends, you know, it's those individuals because, um, you know, they, they some people will constantly pick at you always. Like always, like literally, like they always just make sure you see them. Like, yeah, I don't care how good you're doing. Don't forget that, you know, you used to be my friend. And yes, you found out that I was a piece of shit, but so what? You know, <laughs> like, like you're never going to forget me. And um, I think a lot of times when you've had those relationships where you were close with people and they did burn you, you know, sometimes that plays out in your current relationships because you see little things that a person may do and you like, Oh, that feels like, you know, the the the, the other relationship, and you know now it's. I, I remember how that relationship ended. Are you are you going that route? And um, yeah, I mean that's 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 happened recently a couple of times. You know, with a couple a couple of people who I who I love, I still love, I love them dearly. But you know, I think that what helps me with that, and it's just as therapy talk is just understanding, like, man, sadly some relationships just run this course, you know, like, like people come into your life for reasons, seasons, and, and, and if you're lucky lifetimes, you know, but it doesn't matter if the relationship was a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, like time means nothing. Like everybody, we all outgrow people. And sometimes people outgrow us. I outgrew Jonathan five years ago, but he's still I just hanging have... around. <laughs> <laughs> and you say that in your book, you, you talk about how we need to outgrow people sometimes to change, to really change who we are. We also have to change the people who are around us sometimes. Oh, absolutely. A hundred percent. I mean, man, I, I love, there's so many people that I love. And I think about that, right? I think about even when I was, you know, selling dope back in Mount's Corner, South Carolina, like I just living in Mount's Corner growing up, like there was such a sense of community. Like I had such a, a big crew of, of people and, you know, now I don't have that at all. And it, it hurts you know, sometime, but it's like, yo, I, I chose a different route and, you know, I cannot, um, I can't, I can't ruin everything that I got going on now and my future just because I'm trying to hold on, you know, to what was, 
you know, some things are, they, they, this, they're in the past for a reason, you know? So yeah, that's it, it, even thinking about it now, it's like, ah, oh, it hurts. Cause I'm, I'm, li- I'm literally in South Carolina right now. I'm home in South Carolina, but I'm, I'm, I'm in Kiowa Island actually. And it's like, I would love to, you know, have some of my, and, and don't get me wrong, I do have, still have friends that, that are, you know, coming over this weekend, but it's just like, you know, I got, I got homeboys that are no longer here that I love, like, you know, th- that are dead, like my man Jarrell. You write so beautifully about, especially those, those male friendships, which I think is also really special, you know, to hear you, yeah. That's what it is. I just think sometimes men, we bond over the stupidest things. You know, we bond over the we bond over the most toxic things. When the reality is, we just all want companionship. I, I I was thinking about this the other day, and it's something I'm exploring about you know peer pressure, and you know we always say how uh you know peer pressure, peer pressure. I don't think there is anything as peer pressure. I think that we just all long to be accepted, and we all will do whatever it is we need to do to be accepted by whoever we're trying to be accepted by. Like nobody's. You don't have anybody pressuring us to do anything. <laughs> the only the only pressure is that we want to be accepted by people. When we were in Toronto this last time, Jonathan's from Toronto. When we were in Toronto, um, you you expressed some kind of similar anxiety about what it's like to go home, what it's like to go back to the place, you know, where all the people that you were raised with were. Um, and it just reminded me of that when uh, he was talking about it. I mean, there's a ton of people I love, but also the version of myself that was a confused kid is the person that they know. And so yeah. it's hard not to resort to that person or go back to that person or that way of being or have that, you know, almost viscerally uh, be reminded of that when you're with those people instead of bringing the person I am now and meeting them anew. Yo, Jonathan, you just hit it on the head because that's exactly what it is because these people really don't know me anymore. And, and they know a version of me that I'm literally trying to heal. I'm trying to heal that sixth grade version of myself. I'm trying to heal that 17 year old version of myself. Like, you know, I, I, I fully embrace it. I fully embrace every single version of who I've, who I've been in my life. But as I'm healing this 44 year old version of me, I'm, you know, it's like, it's like back to the future, right? Like you're going back, you're fixing, you know, things from, from the past. And yes, those people bring you right back to that time. And they, they might start talking to you about things that they didn't even know traumatized you. So now you're triggered all over again. And so, yeah, I don't want to be around that. Mayim and I talked about time not being linear. And this is kind of one of those examples where the versions of ourselves from the past exist and they can be brought up and we don't even realize that we're getting into that headspace. Oh, man. And, and guess what? With the internet nowadays, especially if you've been in entertainment for any long period of time, all of those different versions of you exist at once. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's literally like the multiverse of madness. Like all of these different versions of you exist all at one time. And it's like, man, I, I have people literally come up to me and ask me about things like it happened yesterday. And I'll be like, yo, I don't even know what you're talking about. And, but, but like this happened to me recently, uh, like a few months ago, this, this, this guy came up to me. Uh, I was in Harlem. Um, and I was in this, uh, I was in this project. I can't remember the name of the project, but I was there because uh, my, my man Robert Smith was unveiling this mobile prostate cancer unit he had. But he did it in this, um, this, this project in Harlem. And this guy, you know, came up to me and he, he was, he wasn't angry, but I could tell he wasn't happy either. And he was talking to me about something that was said on the radio five or six years ago, and it wasn't even said by me. It was, just, it was said on my show, but it wasn't even said by me. And when I saw that he was upset, I was just was like, well, first of all. I apologize if, you know, I upset you or anything you heard on the show upset you, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't our intention. And it's like, I saw everything just leave from him. Like, oh, he, he wasn't expecting an apology, but I'm saying all that to say, this was six years ago. I, I had forgotten what he was talking about. I had to go back and watch <laughs> what he even was addressing. But in his mind, think about how long he's probably held on to that thing that was said in 2017. There's something that this makes me think about, which is in your book, you talk about Wolverine and you talk about also having a superpower yourself and you talk about the ability to get over things quickly, which I'd love to hear more about. But what you just spoke about made me realize that you also have a tremendous ability to Mm de-escalate. You're in a lot of situations where you're confronting people with your truth that it 
doesn't go that well for them, meaning that you get a big reaction from them. <laughs> and yeah. that's a little bit of my nightmare scenario. <laughs> I, of course, want to speak my truth. My nightmare is having have to say something to people that they have a massive reaction to. And, you know, you've made a career out of sitting in that and holding space for that, which is, I actually think a superpower in and of itself to be able to be like, this is who I am. And I'm going to let you have whatever reaction you have. And you're going to stay calm and not back down and deescalate or try to form an understanding. And mm -hmm. I mean, that to me is a superpower. And I think is like, honestly, energy magic that you're doing. Yeah, I think because um, uh, I'm, I, it's not I'm, my my intent is not to uh, my intent is not to not to inflame hurt, hurt, inflame or hurt anybody, you know. So it's just like I always say, man, I'm not gonna say anything about a person that I wouldn't say to them. But you're more comfortable saying things to people than other people are. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would rather I would rather have that conversation right. with a person. I would rather tell a person, hey, you know, I, I'm not really feeling your music. Or I'm not. You know, I, well, I think what you said over here was kind of crazy. Like, I, I don't mind the debate. I don't mind, you know, the conversation. Like, and, and sometimes, you know, you have conversations with people and they might change your mind. Like, you might have said something about an individual and then they said something that made you look at it a totally, you know, different way. But also that's very, it, it's very, it's very Southern. Like, you say what you mean, you mean what you say. Because right. the fact is, in our industry, and I consider us a similar industry just because, you know, we're both people and personalities and social media and we're out there and so much of the industry and this culture of our industry is like everything's amazing you're great everything <laughs> you do is perfect like you shit gold you know like that's just because that's how a lot of celebrities in particular are used to people treating them and I think what's really awesome about you is that like you you have a way to be true to yourself and also you're making it very entertaining and I think that's a, a piece that people need to remember like you are an you're an entertainer like you are yeah. you're creating and facilitating conversations and you're super smart and like all these amazing things but you also I mean you are you are an entertainer meaning everything's going to fit into is the mic on you know I don't know what you're like in your you know kind of other world personal life <laughs> Miami Alex Breakdown is supported by ZipRecruiter. Hiring can be so challenging, especially right now, especially if you have a lot on your plate. Luckily, there's one place you can go where hiring is simple. It's fast, it's smart. It's a place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. That place is ZipRecruiter.com slash break. ZipRecruiter does the work for you. They use their powerful technology to find and match the right candidates up with your job. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply. ZipRecruiter is also so effective. Four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. No wonder ZipRecruiter is the number one rated hiring site based on G2 satisfaction ratings as of January 1st, 2022. And right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, our listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash break. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash B-R-E-A-K. ZipRecruiter.com slash break. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Miami Alex Breakdown is supported by Nutrafol. 30 million women are impacted by weakened or thinning hair. If you're among them, know you're not alone. I'm among them as well. And there's a solution you can trust to deliver results. Thousands of women have taken back control of their hair with Nutrafol. Many raved that the supplement not only transformed their hair, but it restored their confidence. Hair is a huge part of our identity and our confidence. Nutrafol has two targeted formulas for women. They're clinically shown to improve hair growth and thickness with less shedding. And this happens through all stages of life with Nutrafol. Healthier hair growth takes time. You'll begin to experience thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in three to six months. In fact, in a clinical study, 86% of women reported improved hair growth after six months. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show. Go to Nutrafol.com, enter the promo code BREAK, and you'll save $15 off your first month subscription. This is their best offer anywhere. It's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time and free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code BREAK. One thing that you didn't really mention at all, and I was looking for it in both of the books, and I was so excited to get to ask you about it. You obviously acknowledge like you're a very honest person. You take people, you know, you tell people exactly what they, you know, what you think and like blah, blah, blah. And that's like a thing. But you're very funny. 
and you're very good with words. So there's a lot of people who are honest and they're not funny or they're not skilled with words and thoughts. You're a very quick, like, those are things that I'm actually, like, where did that part of you come from? Like, you know, you're, you're so like, you're, you're quick on your feet. And like I said, plenty of people have been honest with me and it didn't make me laugh. Like, even if you were to say to me, like, you're ugly, I hate you. Like, I'm sure you would do it in a way that's funny and engaging. Where does that come from? Like, uh, how uh, that's, you- that's, all, uh, that's all the country upbringing. That's all Monk's Corner, South Carolina. That's my dad, that's my uncles, that's my aunts. You know, that's my mom. That's that's like the people I was always around. Like you got to think, we didn't have anything. We didn't. We grew up on dirt roads in 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 a, in the rural South. All we did was clown and joke. And now that I'm older, I also realized that we turned all of our trauma and pain into laughs. Like when when Kevin Hart came out with that uh, special called "Laugh at My Pain," yep. I understood exactly what he was talking about because literally to this day, I do not know why everything that was not supposed to be funny was so damn funny to us. And I, I remember um, we used to say, we used to literally say good laugh. Like, like somebody would say something funny, we'd be like, good laugh, good laugh. And that we, we used to, every day we, we, we strived to get like a good hearty laugh. Like that's what made us all feel good. And I'm talking about, we used to be like ruthless with it. Like, cause we used to, you know, in Monk's Corner, Monk's Corner is a small town. When I was growing up, it was like 7,000 people there. So there used to be a paper in the town called the Berkeley Independent. So if you went to jail, it was in the Berkeley Independent. <laughs> if you got evicted, it was in the Berkeley right. Independent, like anything. And it's like, we would literally laugh at people being evicted. We'd laugh at the tax people coming to take away folks mobile homes. Yeah, my daddy was ruthless. My dad and my cousin Rel, well, I, he's, I call him cousin Rel, but he's actually like my dad's cousin. These guys had the darkest humor ever. And at the time, I didn't know it was dark humor. I just thought that's the way people would joke. Like, my dad will call you and be like, yeah, man, um, such and such won't be with us on Sunday. And I'd be like, damn, why, why, why they can't make it? Oh, they died in a car accident. Like, still, like it's like, it'd be just, just always like, that's just how you're going to deliver that? And I remember when John Ritter died, and my dad has always had like this, you know, like, like a little sh- juke joint, like a little sugar shack, you know, they sell beer and liquor and stuff. And I remember when he died, him and my cousin Red, it was like, good, glad he died. Been in that house with them women all those years and didn't, didn't fuck nothing. And I'm like, at the time I just laughed, right? Cause I'm just like, I, I didn't think nothing of it. Yeah. But then you think back and it's like, Jesus Christ, that was dog pops. <laughs> no. I mean, look, my my um, my parents are from the South Bronx and they were born during World War Two. And my wow. my my dad said every single person on that block, him included, had the most vile nickname. Like one of my dad's cousins, my cousin Stanley, we also my dad's cousin. They just called him Fat Stanley. And then they called his brother <laughs> Diaper because it always looked like he was wearing a diaper. It's like, and my, my, but my dad said, like, that was the culture that you grew up in. Every, but like, you had to pick at every single thing. And it's true. It's very like Borscht Belt Jewish comedians. It's like, you complain about everything and everyone. It's why Seinfeld was successful. People love watching that. I, I had a homeboy named Shitty Diaper. <laughs> We used to call him Shitty Diaper. Okay, was there a better a, story? How he got that name? Nah, he just had like a, <laughs> yeah, like a fat ass. When you take off, <laughs> I, guess, I guess instead of saying, "Yo, you got a fat ass," like Shitty Diaper. Like, like, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> he had a diaper full of yeah, shit. Yeah, no, I get it. <laughs> and I, and and, and I also say, uh, I say all the time, the craziest people in America come from the Bronx and all the floor. <laughs> so that's well, like, my my grandparents <laughs> lived in the Bronx and then moved to Florida. So there you have it. And, 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 you know, so even when you talk about humor, like, I never even thought about it. Like, I never, literally, that's just how I grew up. Like, this weekend, I have friends over and family over, and we're going to be in here drinking and laughing about things that probably shouldn't even be funny. But it's like, that's just the way we were, were raised. And I, I think it's something that, that Jonathan and I talk about a lot, both because we, we have terribly dark <laughs> six senses of humor, um, we also write together. So we sometimes are also in an exchange of things. I know I've gone too far when she starts to cry. <laughs> when he says, is that, this is a piece of shit. This is a piece of shit. But I just, that's just a writer's term. Anyway. Is that, is that, that's so interesting. Like, cause I, I mean, damn, what's, what's 2022 too far is 
not as far as what we came up on. Like we came up, oh. we grew up in the night. We grew up in the 1900s. Totally. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? You go back and you watch the stuff that we used to watch yep. and listen to the music we used to listen to. Whoa. Yep. Now it's like, it's, what's too far in 2022? I think also that's, it's part of what what you have been dealing with. And like, it's what you deal with on your show, it's what you kind of deal with as your your public persona. When you talk about our desire to kind of fit in, you know, it's like the human condition, right? Like you wanna be unusual, but not too unusual that you're not, you know, still seen as kind of like one of the gang. You were raised Jehovah's Witness, which is um, a, a denomination, as it were, that not a lot of people know about. I, I actually, I went to public school my whole life in Los Angeles and, um, there, I, I don't, you know what? It's a very generic name, so I'll say it. Elizabeth Lee was Jehovah's Witness. And when we would say the Pledge of Allegiance, she wouldn't raise her hand. And like, that was the first thing I learned. And when it was birthday day, like, she couldn't celebrate and she couldn't sing with us. Um, and you, d did you grow up in a community of Jehovah's Witness? Was it both of your parents, more your mom? It was my mom and dad until my dad got this fellowship. Uh, which is basically when they exile you out of the kingdom hall. <laughs> okay. And you, you you go to the kingdom hall and they don't speak to you, wow. you know, which I think is so strange. Because um, I feel like you should embrace people when they're going through something. I mean, that's what Jesus would do, mistake. just saying. Yeah, now that I think about it, Jehovah's Witnesses introduced cancel culture to the world. <laughs> Because that's what they <laughs> that's what they would do when they would disfellowship you. That was like the earliest form the Mormon, of cancel culture. The Mormons also have a process of uh, excommunication. It's one of those things that is, it's very noticeable to be Jehovah's Witness because it comes up all the time, like birthdays and parties and pledges of allegiance and things. Um, did that have a big impact on you or was it just like, oh, I'm a little bit different and that's weird and whatever? Um, I realize now that my dad uh, made sure that whatever is attached to those holidays, meaning like Christmas, my dad would make sure I he's got the right. new Nintendo, or he's got the high tech. So at the end of the day, that's all that matters. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're not getting any gifts, that's why I think it probably could be cruel. And you know, the other kids are teasing you for mm -hmm. not getting any gifts. But when you got the gifts, it's like, hey, and sometimes I got better things than y'all got for Christmas. <laughs> y'all got socks. I got the new Nintendo, Super Mario Brothers, Duck Hunt, what's happening? You know? So it's like, that's, it, it didn't really influence me until I got older. When I got older and I started like, doing it for my kids like cause my, my my wife is not a jehovah witness so it's like we got four kids and i love the holidays for no other reason than i just like celebrating the holiday right. like there's no religious aspect to it or anything i just like christmas so but you 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 talk a lot about god in many different ways um and one of one of the quotes that um i wrote down God tells you where to go, but he's not loud and he won't repeat himself. And I That's love right. that. I love that because you talk a lot, especially in black privilege, about the work that you put in to come from where you came from, to go through what you went through, and then to get to where you are in so many versions, really, of this career and yourself. Um, but I love that notion of like, if you feel it, you know, if it's in your gut and you hear it, <laughs> act on it. There's not a need to kind of wait. I wonder how much do you feel um, kind of guided by this sort of power greater than yourself? Uh, 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 tremendously. If I, if I, if, if it was like, if it was NBA 2K, it'd be like a 99. Mm. Like that's, that, that's, that's the rating I would have when it comes to, you know, being guided by a higher power. I don't know anything else. I remember being young and feeling this presence around me all of the time. And it was for a long time, I thought it was Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five because I had their, their poster on my wall. So I always felt like it was them watching over me. It was like a poster I had over my bed and I'd be looking up and see Michael Jackson mm. and the Jackson Five. And I'm like, oh, that's who's watching over me. But no, it was it was God. I, I, whether you are an atheist or you know mm -hmm. you believe in Allah or Jehovah or Buddha, whatever it is, you know, there's a higher power that is maneuvering us all. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I, you can go stand on the beach and just look at the ocean and say to yourself, man didn't make that. <laughs> you know, you don't even gotta go that far. How about just look in the mirror? Look at, look at this, look at what, look, look at what we are, what we're doing, how we're di divinely designed, like something greater than us absolutely positively uh, put all of this together. And 
I've been feeling that presence my whole entire life. And, and, and the reason I say that about, you know, God is not loud. He doesn't, re or she, 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 because I, I have, I believe God has to be a woman. She doesn't repeat her, herself is because. Why, why does God have to be a woman? I mean, I'm fine with it. I'm just curious. I, I have a few reasons why I think God is a woman. I think God is a woman simply because when you think about divine nature and order of things women are the leaders women are the bearers of life they carry life for nine months then they bring life into the world and the first entity that we're attached to our, our first view i think of god our, our, our feeling of god comes from this woman who who birthed you mm -hmm. you know and then and then usually after that it's the, the mother it's your grandmother the person who birthed your mom like that's when you feel that unconditional love from a person that unconditional love that they say god has for us you feel that in your mother and your grandmother if you don't believe me just look at serial killers right a serial killer's mother will still be in court that's my baby. My baby would never, it don't matter how many heads they found buried in this guy's yard, how many limbs they found in this guy's freezer, the mother will still be there loving and on that individual. And sometimes the girlfriend. Sometimes and the girlfriend. Sometimes, sometimes the girlfriend, but even still, that still goes to my point. Yeah. Like, I just feel like, yo, God has to have more feminine, you know, qualities than he does male qualities and even with all of that all of that is just like those are just terms and For labels sure. we, we give to each other like you're talking into a microphone but that's only because somebody called it a microphone oh i that love you so much i love him yeah that yeah. could be a foot that's right it you could be I mean? a foot it's, it's just labels i love it okay wait i got another question i just i just got very excited you describe some very exceptional experiences with what other people might call supernatural things um you call it, do you call them supernormal? Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. supernatural, supernormal. Right. Yep. So this is something I, I I have no problem with, just letting you know this is a safe place. We've talked about a lot of it. We've talked about ghosts. We've done it all. Um, I am I'm curious though, is that something that sort of lives with you all the time? Meaning feeling kind of not that you have access, but being aware of other energies. I don't even know what to call it. Absolutely, 100%, all the time. Like, you know, I'm very aware of when my energy goes up and when my energy goes down. And like, I'm in, I'm in, a, I'm, I'm in Kiowa Island right now. And I, I told my wife, I'm like, I, I said, I, I like it here. Like, it's a lot of good energy. It's a lot of good spirits here. And I remember, you know, I'm, I'm walking, my 14 year old was like, uh, you know, no, I was actually explaining something to somebody. And I was like, man, I think the reason I love it here is because I feel like so many of my ancestors came through that water mm. onto, you know, this land. And I just, I felt them, I feel them. And like, I've, 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 I've had random encounters with like uh, spirit guides, mediums. And like, I've had spirit guides just walk up to me in the street and say, hey, you have so many guides around you don't like literally like don't freak out you have so many spirit guides around you and i just want you to know that all your spirit guides are working together to make sure you fulfill your destiny and do what it is that you're here to do and i've always felt like that i've always felt covered and i've seen things i've seen ghosts <laughs> you know i've seen you know what 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 in south carolina we call the hag right. I, I've, I've i've had toys that I feel would come to life when I was younger and like I'm seeing these things and I could tell when some of them were evil spirits and some of them were bad spirits I talk about it in black privilege I took one of the toys that used to you know come alive this little this guy that used to, it was a farmer on top of this right. tractor and the farmer used to come and come off the tractor and I'm just like I remember taking that tractor and throwing it uh on the fire because we used to have to burn our trash in the country we didn't mm -hmm. have you know garbage men picking up trash back then so we used to have to burn the trash and I saw this entity screaming, like, ah, you know, and I, listen, people can say I'm nuts and crazy. I, I can only tell you what I saw. And what'd your mom say? My mom was always patient. My dad probably thought I was batshit crazy, you know, but my mom was always patient. But then, you know, the interesting thing about my, my mom and dad, they both from the country. So they both, you know, believe in 
spirits and, and things of that nature. Like my mom will dismiss it as, no, we don't, that's, that's you know, the, in the Bible, you need to pray more, things like that. My dad was more like, okay, I, you know, let's make sure nobody got anything on him, like roots or anything like that. Let's make sure that the energy is, is clean around him. And it's funny because I do so much energy cleansing and saging and everything yeah. now. But back then, you know, that wasn't the language. You know, it was just, let's just make sure he's good. Let's make sure nobody got nothing on him. Let's pray it, pray it off him. This is kind of where I was going earlier when I was talking about you as a healer and a facilitator. When you're on your show and you're not, I mean, in a tense moment with someone, do you see it as an energy that you're like bringing a truth and awareness together? Do you see that like, you know, are, like, are you doing energy magic in that while you're having that conversation? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because most of the time, you know, I know what I've said. I know what I've said about somebody, you know, and, and if they're coming on the show, they're coming on the show to address it. And I, I really just chalk that up, honestly, you know, Jonathan, to just being in worse situations. You know what I mean? Like I've had guns pulled on me before. I've been in brawls like it, a, a confrontation with a celebrity on a radio show that's light <laughs> you know what i mean we're in a we're in a building with cameras everywhere it's like what what's going to happen like what's going to really happen in a situation like that and plus i don't ever think that any of those people would resort to violence i know i wouldn't resort to violence like we all got a lot to lose i don't know that i think of like fearing violence it's more that there's a an emotional tension. There's a charge. That makes me really nervous when I think, because also like, keep in mind, we, we're on, you know, kind of other sides of the microphone in that. I am brought into scenarios. I mean, I've been interviewed by Howard Stern. Like I sat in Howard Stern's studio and was like, what is gonna happen next, right? So when someone's kind of brought into that space, like, anything can happen. I've had people say horrible things to me. You know, like you have to just like, you've got to be on it and not take it too seriously, but it's intense. Also not even about violence, but what you're doing is you're facilitating. So I've done a ton of hands-on somatic work where people are processing emotion. And when you have a conversation with someone, you're holding space for whatever charge comes up. And so to me, that's a lot like a somatic somatic work because you're helping someone face something. And anytime someone has a charge, you know, there has to be someone to hold space for them to have that emotion and them to work it through. And so I guess that's what I was saying. If you sense energy in your other life, I was wondering if you sense it also in the room and you're sort of navigating it. And maybe it's a sixth sense that you're not even aware of you're doing it because it's so automatic to you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's definitely some type of sixth sense. It's definitely an energy. If the energy isn't right, I'm not sticking around. Like, and 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 that's also like that's that's why I say anxiety sometimes is is a superpower. And the, the beauty of having these conversations about anxiety now, you know, we we we're all sitting at home sometimes, and you know, we know we gotta be somewhere. And we're like, I shouldn't be there. Something's telling me I should not be there. And, you know, back in the day, we couldn't have these conversations. So we would have to show up. Yep. And that's when things would happen. And now when I feel like that, I'm literally like, yo, I'm not going. You're being guided. Why are you not going? That's right. I, and and I, I'm, I'll say I'm not going because I don't feel like it. Y'all know how I get down. Y'all know I'm going. I'm not putting myself in a situation where I know I'm going to have some type of panic attack, anxiety attack, or my energy is gonna be drained so much that I'm gonna be sitting in this place feeling exhausted and depressed. I'm not doing it anymore at all. That leads me to the sense of optimism that you have and the inspiration that you convey about people's ability to change their life, to have the life that they want, if they're tuned in and are following their intuition, if they're not trying to live someone else's dream that isn't unrealistic, and you talk a lot about getting true to yourself, and the power that they can then have to create the life they want. Well, hold on, I just, can I tell it? I mean, the way that I see it is like, you wanted to be a rapper. That's right. And it was finally one person who was like, dude, you're not gonna be a fucking rapper. Dr. Robert Evans. <laughs> like that was it. Yep. And like yep. that was then, that, then there's your life. Meaning like that was the crossroads. And you were like, he's right. <laughs> and, 
And you built something that was, I mean, you call it demotivating people, right? Like, I think you said to someone, like, you're not going to be the next Beyonce or Rihanna, I promise. Like, move on, go to school, read a book, like, live your best life, not the life that social media is telling you to have or that the industry is telling you to have. Yeah, I think a lot of times when, when when you grow up in certain environments, especially when you you're a black person, the people you see on TV that right. you know, or the people that you see that are successful, that look like you, are usually in entertainment or in athletics. Right. So you gravitate towards those things because you just want to be successful. But the truth to the matter is, it's just like yo, that's not your dream. That's not what you know God has planned for you. That's something that you see working for somebody else, and that's why nine times out of 10, it doesn't work for, you know, any of those individuals. I was, I was even talking about, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about, you know, why people commit crimes. It's not that people wake up and want to be drug dealers. It's not that they wake up and, you know, want to be thieves. Oh, literally. Oh yeah. My, my, a guy was giving me a shave earlier. My man, um, Antoine and Antoine, you know, he pulled up in a Maserati and he had a blazer on, he was dressed clean. And I'm like, wow. You know, and I'm like, yo, people need to see this. And the reason people need to see this is because kids gravitate towards stuff like that. They see you with your nice car and your nice clothes. And they're like, well, what do you do? As soon as you tell them what you do, I promise you, you're planting the seed in that kid head that makes him say, I want to do that too. Mm -hmm. That That is the reason so many people wanted to be rappers. That is the reason so many, you, you hear a million stories about people who got into the hustling game because they saw somebody pull up in a nice car. And I, I saw Muhammad Ali, uh, this is an old Muhammad Ali um. Uh, interview where he was like, yo, he has to pull up in those things. He has to have the Rolls Royce. He has to have the jewelry on because nobody wants to listen to you when you don't. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't personally feel that way, but I understand, you know, the concept. Well, and also I, I do want to acknowledge that, you know, for, for most of history, uh, you know, save the last, I don't know, five years on social media for, for many even well-meaning unknowingly bigoted or racist white Americans, the notion was black people must like to do crime and go to prison, right? Meaning this is a new concept to say, no, there's a larger story to why every community struggles with what they struggle with and wants to do what they do to not have that, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah, is vague? no, that makes sense. I mean, it, it's that, what you just described is, 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 is something that I've always, was something I've been exploring as well, because it's just like, I want to know how America has convinced themselves that black people are, the, are like the criminals and the, the thugs and, and the corrupt ones when white Americans created colonization throughout the whole world. <laughs> you know, think about how much blood has been shed in the name of colonization. If, if we should be fearing anyone, it should be, white Americans, like, you know, evil is not sustainable. So right now what white people are getting, it's a small, small, small dose of what minorities have been getting in this country forever. Yep. And they are losing their minds <laughs> because of it. But it's simply because we collectively have not come together as a country, which we should have done a long time ago and really heal, you know, some of these things that have been going on. Really, really America should have, America should have you know, done everything in his power to atone for this original sin, you know, which was slavery, you know, and, and not to mention what was done to Native Americans. I was going to say, you know? yeah, the, the, the history of this country is um, certainly very, very unclean. Um, you know, and that being said, it's the only reason, you know, I exist is because this country took in, you know, my family. Uh, they were being turned away from, you know, most other places um, that should have given shelter. So it's very, very complicated. Um, we have a couple more minutes with you. Um, I do want to talk about comics and Marvel. Are you exclusively a Marvel person, not DC? I am exclusively a Marvel person. Huh. I think DC sucks. I will say <laughs> DC's, DC's film universe, I like the villains. Okay. I think DC should focus more on the villains, the Harley Quinns. Yep. You know, the Jokers, like those movies have been great. They Same. always mess it up with the hero, mm -hmm. the hero films. I'm a Marvel I'm sorry, wait, guy. wait, hold on, wait. One more thing. Which Batman do you hate the most? Ben Affleck. <laughs> not, not, a, even, not a single not, pause there. That's amazing. Not, no, no, okay. not yet, not at okay, all. So ben, Affleck, ben Affleck does not deserve J-Lo because he's <laughs> ruined two superheroes.
He ruined Daredevil and he ruined Batman. Okay, hold on. He does not. He does not deserve J Lo just because he okay. ruined two superheroes. So that should be a rule in life. If you ruin two superheroes, <laughs> out. two, oh. you cannot have somebody like J Lo. No. <laughs> She's Jenny from the block, um, from the Bronx. Also, just yep. shout out to the Bronx. Uh, so tell me about your kind of Marvel world. Were you into comics as a kid? I mean, you talk in your book also about how you you began life as a nerd and it didn't go that well. Was comics sort of part of that part of you? You were like that guy. Absolutely. Yeah, Jonathan mentioned earlier, you see this, this yes. tattoo? This is, this is Wolverine from the X-Men. I know who Wolverine is. But I don't know if you can tell because this tattoo is so trash. Right. But I got, I I got this, it. I got this, I got this tattoo when I was like, 17 years old when tattoos were illegal to get in South Carolina. Wow. So my man, I was going to say that illustrations about from 1978, I think. Yes. So, so my man T Willis, he had a tattoo gun and it was just one of those things like, Oh, let's go to T Willis and get a tattoo. Like oh I'm talking gosh. about like 20 bucks, 25 bucks, <laughs> maybe 50 bucks. And he, he, I said, I wanted to get, I told him I want Wolverine holding a microphone. Cause I thought I was going to be a rapper. And I always gravitated towards Wolverine because I loved his healing power. Like that, that, that literally is why I loved Wolverine. I loved his healing power. And in my mind, that's what I did. I always thought, okay, I'm able to move on from things quickly. The reality of the situation is I was just suppressing a whole bunch of things that I shouldn't have been suppressing. So was Wolverine, that's what the last movie was for. <laughs> that's right. No, that's real. And so it's just like, I remember telling him I was going to get all of these covered up. Like, cause I, they, you know, I was like, oh, they don't mean anything to me. And then I'm like, man, a couple of years ago, it just hit me like, Yo, I got Wolverine <laughs> on my arm holding a microphone because I thought I was going to be a rapper when the reality is the microphone did change my life. Yeah. It was the radio That's microphone right. and, and podcast. And now I'm on a healing journey and I've stumbled upon helping other people heal, heal as well. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, man, God really does not waste anything. Like every single thing in your life happens for, for some purpose that you may not even realize here's a very very deep cut i have a cat and her name is addy because her full name is adamantium because wow. she was born without a chest muscle without a pectoral muscle and she had to have a surgery that had a thin piece of metal inserted through her back so my kids we were like she's got metal inside of her she's like wolverine so that is that is our Addie. Um, I'm a very big X-Men person in particular. Um, you know, a lot of those larger themes and, you know, the Holocaust origin story for Magneto, like all of that stuff. Yeah. That's, it's, you know, first class is really, I just, I love X-Men, but also do love superheroes. I work for Warner Brothers though, which is DC. So it's a whole other world when I go She's to She's in work. an inner conflict got, with I'm herself. I'm in a big, big conflict. Um, what, what has been your favorite um, kind of modern Marvel experience? Uh, I mean, in, in more recent times, it's been the, um, the, the well, a few things. The Tanahashi Coates uh, run of Black Panther. Okay, got and, it. And, and the whole and the whole world of Wakanda yep. that he created that was great. Uh, I love Riri Williams, mm -hmm. Ironheart. Uh -huh. um, I liked the new uh, Captain Marvels that came out okay. in the comics. And as far as the TV and films, man, I think that I'm not really loving. Marvel movies mm -hmm. in this phase, but I love the TV shows. Got the it. TV shows have been great. I mean, everything from Moon Knight to WandaVision to the What If cartoon yep. to uh, Miss Marvel to now She-Hulk, like that has been phenomenal. And I and I, I love that Marvel is developing, not developing, but really showcasing their women characters because they didn't do that in the first 10 years of the films at all. That's why I hated, I thought that was like a terrible scene in Endgame. When you know, uh, Captain, when when uh, what happened? Uh, when, when Captain Marvel comes in, they're like, oh, Cap "Oh, Captain Marvel gets the Infinity Gauntlet from Spider Man," and he's like, "I don't know how you're gonna get through all of that." And they're like, "She's got help." And then all of the women characters come, and I'm just <laughs> yes. like, "Man, Marvel!" I'm like, it, it just showcased how much they dropped the ball totally. over the last ten years. I totally but, agree. But they have all of these great women characters in the Marvel right. universe. I'm not saying that those characters on the screen aren't great, but that's not the A-team. Right. You know, like, where's the A-team characters other than Captain Marvel? And it was, I didn't like that scene. I'm like, Captain Marvel, we just saw her run through a whole ship. Right. She don't need no help running through no these, Thank you. these people. A voice of reason. You've spoken to so many people in your career. Is there anyone on your, like, you want to talk to list that you haven't gotten to talk to? 
one person, and the answer is always the same: Judy Bloom. Oh my God, Judy Bloom. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta sit down and talk to Judy Bloom. I, my mom, I I'm, love Judy Bloom. We read the same books. You read Ramona yeah. Quimby, like you read all those books. All of them. We were in mom, it together across the country. You and me were having parallel lives. That's right. My mom, my mom was an English teacher. Right. And my dad was an English me, teacher. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, both my parents are public school <laughs> teachers, but yeah, both of them English, and then my mom did preschool. And, and she always told me to read things that don't pertain to me. So when I would go in the library. That's what didn't pertain to me. All these books about little white kids, you know. What was your favorite I, Judy Bloom book? Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Classic. Um, but I, but I like I like Blubber as well. <laughs> um, Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Was really good because I that I, I related to that character so much because mm -hmm. I grew up with Jehovah Witness and my my grandmother was a Baptist and then my father got into Islam. So it was always talk to God, talk to God, mm -hmm. talk to God, talk to God. So when I saw the title of that book, Are You There, God? That's me, Margaret. I'm like, that's me every day. That's me every night. Like, so it just, and I was young. I was, man, I don't know, seven, eight when I read that book. So it was just, it just, the title just spoke to me because I was like, oh, there's other people that do what I do. There's other people that, you know, talk to, this entity called God, you know, all the time. And, you know, Blubber was so good because it's like, man, that was the first time we ever heard of people with eating disorders and, you know, people dealing with weight issues. And I mean, thinking about it now, that was such a heavy topic maybe for a, a, a kid because I go back and I read those books now and I understand them more than I did then. But the reason I think Judy was so dope is because, you know, she tackled those topics and she talked about things as socially redeeming value. and. The reason I want to have a conversation with her is because number one, that's what I think got me into my journey of being able to tell a story, you know, and um, I feel like, you know, if you, if you speak about real issues and you do them in a humorous way, they resonate with people more. So that's, that's, and I just want to let her know, like, yo, you really had an impact on a lot of people. She sent me a book though. She, she, cause I, I, I talk about her so much about about three or four Christmases ago, she sent me an autographed copy of Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret, what? me and my daughter. And my daughter did not like it. And I was like, I really wanted to get her blood tested after that. I'm like, <laughs> I really had to think about it. Like, yo, there's no way you don't like Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret. I know this book holds up. You're not going to tell me this book don't hold up. Can I do a quick rapid fire with you and then we'll let you go? Let's do it. It is time for rapid fire breakdown style with Charlemagne the God. What was your mother right about? Everything. Right answer. Every, That's the right everything. answer. Thank every you. Every single thing. Everything. What was your father right about? Not much. Ha! Uh, well, no, I, I say this. My father. No, I'm gonna take that back. Not much, but a lot of the things I had to unlearn was because of my father. But the one thing he said to me that stuck with me, that I hold on to, that absolutely positively got me on the right path, was he told me that if I didn't change my lifestyle, I was gonna end up in jail dead or broke sitting under the tree. And when I saw everybody around me, when I saw that becoming their existence, I said back then when I was 17 years old, oh, he's right about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. That's that's the one thing he was right about. Everything else I've had to unlearn. Location that promotes your best mental health. Anguilla, the island of Anguilla. You talk about it and I think both of your books. Do you have a mantra? Yes, I'm, I am blessed, black and highly favored. What is it, say again? I am blessed. Black and highly favored. I love that. Who's been your best spiritual teacher? Best spiritual teacher. Ooh, oh. I have so many. I, I, I would. I gotta give that to my mom though, mm -hmm. because she opened me up to everybody else. I wouldn't even have the palate to 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 even take in other spiritual leaders and other spiritual teachers if it wasn't for my mom introducing me to you know, the witness, the, the religion of being a Jehovah Witness when I was younger, but not, even bigger than that, just instilling in me that that faith in a higher power. Love it. Um, you talk a lot about intuition and going with your gut. Do you have one moment that sticks out as your moment of best intuition? Yeah, the, fir the first one that came to my mind was, um, it was 2010, uh, I had been unemployed. I got fired from radio for the fourth time. I was back at home living with my mom. My now wife was back at home living with her parents. And literally, I would always go outside at night and just look up at the South Carolina sky and just talk to God and wait for a download. And I remember I went outside one night and I'm talking to God and God said, go to New York. Like, just like that. Like, 
go to New York. Get in your car, go to New York. And I did it. I, I, I went to New York. I didn't know even why. And then, you know, and I, I, I kind of made up a reason. Like I had a, a homegirl who um, at the time wanted to be a model. And so they had like some King Magazine auditions. And, you know, I had some friends who worked at King Magazine. So I kind of used that as an excuse to already do what God wanted me to do. I really just needed somebody to ride with me, right? And sharing some of the driving. So we went and that was the week that uh, I randomly text my man, G-Spin, who was at the time the music director at Power 105.1. And he was like, yo, where are you? And I said, um, I said, I'm in New York for a couple of days. And he was like, yo, come to this. He said, literally come to the station. That's what he said, come to the radio station. And I was like, right now? He said, yes, right now. And I was staying in Fort Lee, New Jersey. And it felt like it took me forever <laughs> to get across that GW bridge at five o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> to get to the radio station. But when I got there, I ended up having a meeting with G-Spin and uh, Cadillac Jack. And that's when the beginning stages of the Breakfast Club was, was put together. That's pretty good intuition. So, I will take that. Yeah, and final yeah. question, who are you most competitive with? I, I, I want to say myself, because that's the cliche answer. And that is true. But I feel like, I feel like I'm just competitive with life. I'm competitive mm. with the world. I'm competitive with everybody who ever told me that I, I wasn't going to make it. You know what I mean? Like I make up beefs. You know what I mean? I start beefing with people who have no <laughs> idea that I'm beefing with them, you know what I mean? Like in, in my mind, you know, in my mind, I'm I'm very, very, very competitive with damn near probably everybody in the space. I'm very comfortable with my position, but I'm also inspired. And I think sometimes that 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 inspiration that you get from other people does make you competitive. But I'm not trying to beat anybody. I'm just trying to be better than me. That's why I, when I hear that question, it's tough to answer because I'm like, I'm not trying to beat anybody. I want everybody to win. I'm just, you know, competing with myself. If someone is listening and they are struggling to find their way, struggling to get clear on their path, what advice would you give them? You, you'll be fine. That's that's part of life. I think that's the thing that drives you crazy the most. One of the things, you know, the, reading The Secret by Rhonda Byrne really messed me up in a lot of ways because the law of attraction is real. But when you when you read your thoughts become things, when you read that with no nuance whatsoever, it can really make you go crazy because you think every time you have a negative thought, a lot of negativity is going to come to you just because that's what's on your mind. When the reality of the situation is it's impossible to not have those negative thoughts creep into your mind. It's impossible to, you know, have it all figure it out all the time. Nobody on this planet does. Like what you just described, Jonathan, is what everybody on this planet will go through. So as soon as you feel that way, to me, you on the path to like finding, finding your way. It's the people that are lost and don't know they're lost that remain lost. It's the people that, you know, are confused and are trying to figure things out who end up figuring things out. So it's like, yo, no matter what you may be going through right now, that confusion you feel, trust me, it's just all part of the process. It's all part of the process. Beautiful. Uh, one final question, then I promise we'll let you go. Do you come, is anyone in your family like a preacher? It's unbelievable. There's a way that you speak and the way you understand things. It's very special. And I think like 2,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago, like he would have been, uh, like you would have been running the whole village. <laughs> <laughs> I love this guidance. And I hope you write more books because I want to know all the things about you. I'm, I'm, I'm literally working on oh, one right now. What is that about? Like, and it's, uh, you know, so I've, 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 li I've been posted to be, I've scrapped, and not scrapped. I've written like two over the last three years since since the pandemic. Um, but I don't know. I just keep getting different downloads yeah. from God, right? So it's just like one book I wanted to do with my father, and I'm not there yet because that one is like yeah. that's woo. That's like a lot, right? So yeah. I'm not I'm not there yet. And then I have another one that I'm I, I'm doing now, and I've I've had the concept for it for a while, and like literally, literally, I wrote like the forward yesterday, and I'm just in a zone. So my zone is I'm gonna write a, a chapter a day over the next you know seven days, because I was I was I, I and it just it just literally hit me yesterday. That's how I, that's another reason I feel like you know there's so so much good energy here on Kiowa Island because I'm like. Oh man, uh, yeah, let's go. And it, I'll, and, I'll be and there the tomorrow. You pick me up at the airport, I'll be right there. I got you, I got um, you. 
I, I think we should write a book together. I don't know what it's about, but I'm going to put that on my list of things to bother Charlemagne about. And a double Judy it. Bloom interview. A double Judy Bloom interview. Let's make oh, it happen. Oh, please, man. Please. I'll be there. You tell, listen, we can make that happen. I'll, I'll fly out. We got... What? Because she's getting, she's getting older. We already lost Beverly, clearly. I, I... <laughs> All right, let's go. We'll sign it up. Let's um, do it. This has really been such an incredible treat to speak to you. I... I mean, there. I'm really, really blown away, and I really, really enjoyed your books and getting to know you better. And um, just wow, you're freaking you unbelievable. Much. God bless you and all you do. Oh, and one shameless plug because I know they'll oh, get mad at me. Oh, plug anything uh, and all the things. Every every Thursday night, 11:30 p.m. Uh, Comedy Central. I have a late night talk show called Hell of a Week. It comes on right after the Daily Show on Thursday nights on on, on Comedy Central. Awesome. That's a very special human. I can't wait to see what his next book is. There's so much. Um, Hell of a Week is, uh, as he mentioned, Thursday. It's executive produced by Stephen Colbert. That's it's exciting. a comedic look at the week's events featuring influential guests and his hilarious and unfiltered take on the most talked about topics. Really, really cool. Um, I don't know. I don't think there's anything else we we need to say. Like, he said all the things. And here's the deal. Black Privilege is a book to read. It You learn everything everything about his story and also I was really nervous that it would feel like a here's all the fun things that happened when I had sex with lots of people and you know it dealt drugs because you know he does mention like he's had this kind of life and he's very very respectful in how he talks about his life and the community that he comes from um it's very matter of fact yeah he, it, very matter of fact and not a, it really did not strike me as him trying to sort of capitalize on you know, this, the time in jail, like, it's more about like, what lessons did I learn from when I was in jail with my father? Like, what lessons did I learn? What did I become? What did I want to become? I just... One of the lines we didn't get to that I really liked, God's always got the latest GPS update. Because <laughs> he, he talks about the devil being loud and God being quiet and how The devil he, makes the most noise, like yeah. he says. And how he learned to follow that intuition. And he has a lot of setbacks in his life, a lot of things that I, don't appear to take him towards the but, path that he ends up on. But he said, that's like, that's the part, that's, that's the, there's, a, and I don't mean like there's a plan, like, trust God, God has a plan. What I mean is that like. Well, he kind of does say that. Yeah, but everything is sort of moving along the way it needs to with the lessons you need to learn and the things you need to do and the things you didn't do. And, and he says, refuse to adopt a losing mentality. The level of optimism that he feels even in the face of great setbacks even in the face of panic attacks even in the face of mental health challenges the way that he's able to find that next step forward is truly inspirational he's really he's fantastic and um just yeah i think he's freaking freaking awesome <laughs> all right that's all i got whoo from our breakdown the one we hope you never have See you next time. It's Maya Bialik's breakdown. She's going to break it down for you. She's got a neuroscience PhD or two. One fiction, one and now she's going to break down. It's a breakdown. She's going to break it down.